who were the, yeah, who, they, who, who were the little they, who were the who were the little green ones in the video? Oh, that was a that was a Zeke and Brother Landry's son. Okay, that was that was Zeke. That okay, okay, that was the little ones. Okay, I was yeah. wondering who was <laughs> behind, the, behind the mask. But, uh, good to see you, man. Good to see y'all on tonight on the call. Um, this is always a great time for us on Monday nights at 6 p.m. to just talk real estate, really informal. So jumping in tonight to talk real estate in the Wealth and Real Estate Facebook group. And I see Isaac on the call, Chris Garrison, and Solace is on the call as well. So as folks trickle in tonight, let's let's just check in with each other. Um, maybe I have some highlights of the week, things that you all have have had going on, had success with. Maybe you've got a deal that you want to tell folks. Oh, yeah, that's the one about the um, Let's go ahead and uh, and share what we all have going on. Anybody got anything going on they want to share out this week? Knock, knock. Quiet. Come on, Isaac. What you been up to this week? They're well, kind of uh, pretty much kind of the same thing every week. You know, just looking for deals. Um, you know, I've been using PropStream to pull multi-family lists. I've been contacting sellers trying to... Um, I think I need to start calling some more because I've been just doing mostly text messages and emails, getting some responses, but I really need to start to set set aside some time so I can actually get on the phone and actually call and talk to people. Yeah. So right now you're working, are you you're still working the nine to five? You're fitting this in into that, right? Yeah. Okay. Good deal. Anybody else have any successes this week? Things they're working on? Quiet. So quiet tonight. Let me, uh, I think one of the things to think about um, as you were trying to find more deals, trying to get more deal flow is how many sellers you're talking to and actually tracking that as a metric, right? So Isaac, I'm gonna use you for an example just cause you, you put it out there. How many, how many sellers do you think you have talked to in the last seven days? And do you have a way to, 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 to actually track that? Um, yeah, I kind of use a kind of my own Excel spreadsheet, but, you know, try to track my numbers and when I contact them and stuff this week, I haven't, um, actually spoken with anybody, but in the past month, I've actually Spoken to two sellers. Uh, one of them was an older gentleman with a 28 unit uh, here near me in Gaston County. Um, he wasn't too motivated. He was taking offers and stuff on it, but he didn't seem too motivated at all. Yeah. And, um, and and mostly it's been, you know, again, still with the high prices and, and things like that because of the market. But I've spoken to maybe about two or three, about about the past month okay okay so very important metric anybody else talk to any sellers in the last seven days i see david on the call tonight maybe he wants to share his experience um anybody else talk to any sellers in the last seven days this is uh this um is yeah I'll show you. Go ahead. Uh, so going through a cold call list, um, it's about 35, about 3,500 contacts on that. Um, I guess in the last seven days, probably went through about 200, 200 and a quarter, something like that. Um, and with the, um, so with going through cold calling, it's kind of a mix. Um, I get some really good positive feedback. Uh, some people are really um, seem really, um, you know, willing to do referrals. Um, and 
Um, I've got some some leads off those already from doing it. Um, and then occasionally run across somebody that is got a portfolio or some rental property that they are willing to sell to. Um, a lot of it's just kind of getting um, getting the name out there, let people know what you're doing um, and really kind of building up for um, long term on it and um, just kind of seeing what the you know what the um, <clears throat> what the name getting put out um, is going to do later on but uh so far pretty good not too many hang-ups so that's always a positive um you know some days i go through don't have anybody uh today i had probably three hang up before i get through with my pitch most everybody's pretty um pretty good about letting me get through my spiel first um but uh other than that yeah not too bad awesome 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 so talking to sellers um you know very, I would definitely encourage you all to use some type of tracking system. Whenever my deal flow gets low or when I'm not making enough offers, I can always just kind of do a self check and say, how many sellers have I talked to in the last seven days, right? If it's, if it's zero, um, then I ask myself, why is that? Is it because I'm spending too much time working in my business? Is it because I'm, you know, spending time on tasks that you know, somebody else could be doing. Um, but the more you talk to sellers, the more opportunities you're going to see. Maybe not a lot of the traditional opportunities, but um, opportunities to network, opportunities to learn. Uh, there's always opportunities when you're talking to sellers. So definitely want to encourage that. Um, some things that you could be tracking in your business. I'm going to share a file here that, um, that actually was a uh, shared with me today and I'm going to give credit to Jerry Green for sending me this. So on my screen here, um, let me share this file. I'm going to share my desktop so everybody can see it here. But um, on this screen, he sent me like these four pillars of a real estate business and I'll send this out to anybody who wants this. If you co comment in the comments on Facebook or if you want this, just, just private message me. I'll send this to you. Uh, again, this is not mine. This was Jerry Green's that sent this to me. But uh, at the bottom here, he like talks about things that we should be tracking, right? So the number of daily new leads, uh, the marketing response rate, like how many people are responding to your stuff. If you're text blasting or mailing, you know, how many of those are, are getting response to calls made to sellers? How many appointments are you scheduling? Sound familiar, David? Um, offers made, offers accepted, revenue per week and revenue per month. Knowing your numbers, he says, is one of the four pillars to a, a real estate business. And uh, it was funny today, somebody called me and asked me how much I collected in late fees in the month of October. And he was just joking, like he didn't, he, he was saying, you know, how much do you think you made in late fees? Today's November 1st. And uh, Sheila in my office had already sent me the monthly report for the month of, of October. So I was able to actually tell him how much we made in late fees last month. And this is an important pillar to a real estate business is just being able to track your numbers. So um, very important that we do that. I will share this with anybody that wants this. So just let me know if this is something that y'all want. Private message me and I'll send you that. All right. Any, any other questions? Uh, Things I see we've had some more people come in the room tonight. So any other just check-ins? We do this every Monday night at 6 p.m. It's a Zoom call, very relaxed. Um, anybody else have anything that they want to kind of get started with tonight? Uh, we talk real estate. So if you're trying to grow a real estate business, if you're already growing your real estate business, if you want to talk to other people, I see uh, in the room, we've got wholesalers in the room. We've got passive investors in this room. Uh, we've got uh, professional business owners in the room, real estate investors. We've got, oh, motel owners in the room, right? All kind of stuff going on here. Uh, anybody else have anything going on before I share what I want to share tonight uh, that would help everybody here? I always forget who this real G's walk in silence is. So I think it's Elijah, but I don't remember. So you might have to speak up and say hello so I can remember who you are. I think that's who it was. Anybody else have anything? Uh, I have a question. 
Sure, go ahead. Yeah, we're good. Hey, um, hello, Eugene is here. I'm on Eugene, ma'am. <laughs> How's it going? Um, so a quick question. If, um, if I don't have a, let's say if I wanna invest uh, into someone's deal and uh, I don't have 1 million of uh, net worth yet, uh, what would be another route to go? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So what you're, Hey, Elijah. Yeah, I know you're, I see you. I see you real G's walk in silence. I see you. I see you now, man. Repping his late wife, Jenny. All right, man. Loving you, loving you, continue to pray for you at this time too. But, um, all right. So Eugene is, is, is saying if he wants to invest in somebody else's deal, um, how can he invest if he doesn't have a $1 million net worth? He's referring to the fact that in, in most cases, accredited investors need to have at least a million dollar net worth or a certain income threshold in order to invest in, in other people's deals. Are there other ways to invest in, in other people's deals? Absolutely, Gene. Like you do not have to be an accredited investor to invest in deals. Um, certainly if you're investing in a syndication and that person is uh, requiring you to be accredited then you have to be accredited, but there are other ways to do projects if you're not accredited. So um, just because we're we're live on Facebook today and I'm, I have to be a little bit careful with what gets saved out in the ethos space, I'll just say, um, why don't you contact me outside of the group and uh, or just contact me. But there are ways to invest in other people's deals. One of the ways that I will share is that you can JV with folks, right? So you can actually come in as a partner on a project and it doesn't require you to have a million dollar net worth, right? You can JV um, and do partnerships together. You can also loan money to someone and you don't have to be accredited. So if you were to loan uh, me, for example, some money, I would pay your return on your money and you don't have to actually be accredited for that. So just keep in mind that I'm not an attorney, I'm not your CPA, and you cannot sue me for anything I say because I just said that, okay? Uh, but message <laughs> me outside of, of, uh, of, this, of this call and we, we could definitely talk about that. Remind Gary, I see he's come in the room tonight. I'm glad to have you in as well. Hey, Chris Garrison, you wanna say anything to the people? Y'all, Chris Garrison is headed out here to, to I'm, I'm in Iowa today. And y'all, y'all see this little thing I got on here? This is. This is like Mississippi cold deterrent. This does nothing for Iowa, nothing, okay? Unless so, I know that ain't doing nothing for you out there. I'm just saying, Chris, uh, that little shirt you got on right there, I hope you got something else, buddy. <laughs> I got my thermals packed in the bag and I got a jacket to stick on as soon as I land. I'd like to say something uh, to Eugene about the, the money uh, on the accredited, not being accredited yet. Up on the Facebook groups, I can give you a case study. Um, we just closed a deal last month and we had individuals come in with a few thousand dollars and they're getting 15 and 20% interest um, through a promissory note. So there's several different ways that, that you can get on, in on deals. The accredited situation is really for um, the group that's raising the private money because uh, that allows them to advertise it online. And it's really just kind of a, a risk uh, mitigation system that the SEC stuck in there to make sure, because they think if you've got that much money, then you're financially savvy. Perfect, perfect. Go, cool. thank yeah. you. You about to get yeah, on I was gonna say too that. Yeah, you, can, be, you can be sophisticated. Like I would, I, I would also, like we said, I'm not, you know, I'm not an attorney, not a CPA, but also if you're looking at a credit, it also look under the definition of a sophisticated investor, um, because that's the way you can get into into syndication as well. Like I said, you don't have to, like they say, you don't have to be accredited. It just depends on, like Chris said, the actual uh, deal sponsors and who's um, providing the deal. Got it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Eugene, I'll just say that we, we have several folks that are invested in our deals that are not accredited um, or sophisticated for that matter. And so sometimes it depends on the operator. 
I know there's some folks in the Wealth and Real Estate Facebook group too who, who do deals as JV partners. And uh, we can make some referrals too, just depending on the kind of deal that you want to get involved with. But um, we've got some really cool operators in the group that are doing some cool stuff that I think have uh, ethics and are trustworthy that we can make referrals to as well. Um, we've also got projects too, so. Yeah, um, awesome. I would love to be involved. Awesome, Thank you. awesome. All right, guys. So tonight, um, just briefly, I want to share, because we've got some folks live on Facebook, which is new. Um, I made a post the other day and I got sentimental, y'all, because uh, this right here, let's see if I can make this work. This post in the Wealth and Real Estate Facebook group shows, uh, and I'm trying to make it work here. Let's see if it's gonna work. Boom. All right, I gotta find it. All right, so I'm scrolling down. Um, this post shows like my first project that I did where I was creating an office. Okay. And I want to share the deals on this by the numbers because this is an example of a buy and hold. Y'all can see my screen. All right. This post shows like a picture of what looks to be like an old house from the front. Um, but this property actually is very unique because it was a single family house that was just continued to be added on to. And the back of it has like apartments that are attached to the house. And from the outside, it really looks like one single family house, but um, when I bought it, it was actually five units. There was one unit that the, the owner was using as storage and uh, it was just open. And I wanna share the details on this project. I actually just sold this project. I am having real buy seller's remorse, like real seller's remorse. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you the story on it. This is a photo of it. This is the only photo that that I actually uh, put in the presentation. So I wanted to share that. Um, this is in Tupelo, Mississippi, by the way. And uh, since I'm not the owner of the building anymore, I was careful about uh, not, not giving too much information on the property. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. This is an example. Um, again, this is a project that anybody could do. Um, and that's why I wanna title tonight's talk um, you know, really thinking about a, a buy and hold example, like what it could do. Um, for those of you who don't know, I used to be a teacher, principal of a school, professor of a university, and you may think professors make a lot of money. They don't. Um, you know, it's just a regular job. <laughs> and uh, this deal, I, I want you to think about those numbers, you know, when it comes to like an average $60,000 a year job, because that's what that's what I make it work. Okay, $60,000 a year. So here's an, an example of a buy and hold. And just to get started, I, I wanted to let you know, like my mindset on what what to look for. Okay. So when I bought this property, I'm looking for the owner to be distressed. Okay. I'm looking for uh, the property to be distressed. Glad to see people jumping in tonight. Good to see y'all in here. Hey, Mike Izzo. Um, but I'm looking for the owner to be distressed. I'm looking for the property to be distressed. I'm looking for it to be undervalued. I want I want to just emphasize that um, I'm a cash flow investor, so I look for things to be undervalued. Distress. I mean, there's some kind of problem with the property, right? In this case, the owner needed cash. He hadn't paid his property taxes for the last year. And so he was about to lose his property taxes. That's a distress. That means he might be willing to sell for a discount in order to solve that problem. The property was distressed, right? There were tenants in the property that weren't paying. Um, the property needed some repairs. The city was requiring those repairs. It needed a roof and some other things, okay? And then being undervalued means that in comparison to other properties that were on the market, the price per door on this property was less than properties that were on the market normally, right? So that's what I look for. Um, why was this a deal, okay? And this is very, this is very uh, important that I, I say, why was this a deal to me? Because 
what's a deal to everybody is different. The purchase price on the property for five units was $182,000, okay? Um, remember that there was one vacant unit not being used that could potentially be more income. So the price per door was low, but also there was a unit that was not being used. It just happened to be big enough to create three units out of, right? But it was not being used. So you're looking for something that you can add value to. And that's what I was looking for with this property. There also were five units that were already bringing in money under market rents. So, you know, at the time I didn't have a lot of property. I was also thinking about the need to pay the note, right? Being able to pay the bank loan that I was gonna get. And it's very important that you can do that from buying a property. So it was good to have tenants that were already paying. I think there might've been one or two tenants in here that weren't paying um, ownership change you put in place some good property management and you can get them to st start paying. So questions so far, comments? I'm just gonna rip through these real quick. There's only four slides. Questions or comments so far? When you're saying one unit, they were just like, on they one, one bedroom? Yeah, so one vacant unit, this was a 1500 square foot, just empty space that the owner had open and he wasn't using it for any, he had a bunch, he was a construction guy, he, he did construction. So he had a bunch of his old equipment in there. He was using this to store old equipment. Um, another good way to think about this is this guy owns a lot of property in the city. So he was using this 1500 square feet vacant unit to store materials, uh, to store toilets. I remember there were showers in there things that he was using at job sites, he was using this instead of as income property for storage space, okay? Um, and sorry, I don't have more photos in here of the property, but this is where we're at. So what was the business plan? Number one, the people that were already living there paying $500 a month, like very rare in the city for people to be paying $500 a month. So the first strategy is gonna be to increase rents to market rents, right? Um, that's the first strategy to increase the income is to make sure if a two bedroom was written for 750 to 800, then people needed to be paying 700, 750 to 800 instead of paying 500. Okay. Um, Ramon, the second part of that business plan was to take that 1500 square foot empty space and turn it into two apartments, right? So I did borrow money from the bank in order to do the renovations on that part of the project. But I also was thinking ahead, like, let me create an office because I needed a space for myself. And also that little bitty, there was a space that was not quite big enough for me to, to make it an apartment. Although I really was thinking about how to make it a hermit apartment or something. But I said, let me have this be an office. And so that was part of the business plan was to get two additional units there that were paying an additional thousand dollars a month and also to get an office there. Um, and then to increase total rents to $5,200 a month. So after all of this said and done, the ability to get the total rents up to increase the property value was the goal, okay? So I'm gonna go back to this photo because I want, I, I really wanted to ask y'all a question um, and I'm glad to see people on Facebook Live tonight. That's awesome. Um, I'll, I'm gonna go back to this photo because I wanna ask you a question. Like when you're driving down the street or when you look at a property on the MLS that looks like this, right? How many people have gotten into the habit of thinking about what it could be versus what it is? And I'd like to hear you know, any case examples or stories, but have you all gotten into that habit yet? I know we've been doing this call for about a year. Like, have anybody found themselves looking for opportunity when they see stuff like this right here? Hey, John, it's Demetra. Um, I always, I mean, even though I have yet to purchase my first investment property, but it's coming, I always look at the potential of the what could be because I get them everywhere I go. <laughs> and I'm like, how can we maximize space? What is going to make this property attractive? This was even before I got into real estate. So um, I'm excited to be able to do a project and make it my own and just, just get involved. 
Awesome, awesome. Anybody else? You see a property like this right here, like anybody getting used to seeing opportunity? Generally, you're looking for something that's distressed. That one doesn't look distressed at all. Yeah. Depending on who you are, where you are, right? This yeah. may not look distressed. Um, to the right of this property was the storage shed no. that was empty, right? That had no use other than storage. And it's a residential building where people could actually live in these units, right? Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like this one doesn't look distressed, maybe from the outside. Some people may say it does look distressed. I don't know. The grass looks a little high. It's not a not the clearest picture. <laughs> All right, any anybody else getting used to doing this? My nine year old is getting used to doing this. Right, he sees vacant <laughs> land. He says, um, "Dad, remember the zoo that I said that I wanted to to run? Like, is this a good spot for the zoo? That's him right now. Is is this a good spot for the zoo? Right? That's cute." Um, which I'm, I'm trying to get him to understand zoning. <laughs> but but is, this, is this a good spot for the zoo is, is his question right now. Um, anybody else getting used to this? Like this is a big part of um, buying distressed assets is being able to see beyond what the MLS listing says, being able to see beyond what a realtor tells you or what the, the for sale by owners a lot of times, even the owner doesn't see the potential of property, right? They may just be thinking that this is what it is right now. We want to be thinking about what this could be later. Yeah, there could be land that you could put an ADU on, or um, there could be other uh, uh, structures that are back there that uh, aren't being used. Even even empty lots can be used to to rent out for um, storage for RVs or or boats or whatever, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, last slide, what happened? So I exited this property, um, purchase price was 182,000. Uh, this property was actually bought in 2018. So just realistic timetable. Um, it took about $55,000 to turn those units into apartments. We put a roof on. Um, and then I've rented the property for three years, almost three years exactly right? And three years, that means it's cash flowing. Yeah, it had expenses. Yes, we had to do additional maintenance and repairs. Yes, we had to property manage the property and make sure tenants were paying and um, do collections and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, like $1,500 a month for three years is $54,000. Remember what I told you, I used to make it work, right? <laughs> this, is, uh, this is pretty close, right? And then the sales price of this property after three years, why does it sell for, for so much more three years later? Anybody have any ideas? Your net well, you operating. Had a great realtor. Hey, I had a fantastic <laughs> realtor on this one and Demetria is the realtor. So if you are looking to get something sold, thank you. She's actually got a few things that she's got under contract right now that we're getting rid of. So fantastic realtor. That was a quick plug. What else? Why does it sell for more so, so many years later? Your NOI was more. Net operating income is higher, right? Definitely um, increasing the rents, right? That's the cool part about multifamily investing for those people that are getting involved. Um, you can increase your building's value by running the building better by increasing the rents. Um, you can increase the value of your property right, by um, adding those additional apartments, increase the value of the property. Running the building better increases the value of the property. Why else though? What else makes this happen in three years? Inflation, appreciation. Yeah. Appreciation and inflation tied together, right? Definitely happens. Like everybody's experiencing this right now. You're going to the gas pump, you're seeing gas go up, you're going to a restaurant. Anybody tried to feed their family on a, a restaurant right now? what's happening. You're going to Starbucks, you're seeing inflation. It's also happening to uh, commercial investment properties right now. Appreciation happens and we get to benefit from that. So 
Um, just wanted to share the numbers on this project. Um, I'm gonna take this off the screen and just open up the floor to comments, questions. Um, don't necessarily share the deal out of excitement or joy because I'm a buy and hold investor and uh, I actually regret income going down for, my, from, for the long term. The long term hold is always better. But share this as an opportunity to see like that holding a property gives you several different profit centers, right? You cash flow while you're holding it. You get a little check at the end, right? That, that always is good. Um, I got to write it off on my taxes for depreciation purposes. Um, we got to improve the community, right? That's like, that's the key is that there are people living there now. I mean, Demetri will tell you, you walk in those units from the outside, you wouldn't think they look as good as they do, right? So you got to improve the community. Um, there were people that were looking for housing that couldn't find it. And we created two additional housing units, two additional people boxes, I like to call them, right? So um, that's that project. Comments, questions, um, other yeah, feedback on this particular project. Floor is open. Floor is open. John, why, why did you sell? You know, I don't know, man. You're asking me. When, <laughs> you're asking me when I'm grieving. You're asking me when I'm grieving. Um, you wanted to help your realtor out. You know, she probably knowing her, she probably was praying real hard. And something you know how he puts stuff on your spirit when people be praying. Because this deal actually uh, almost didn't close several times, and uh, my patience is not what it should be. So, she 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 can tell you a little bit about that. I Good. think in the end, though, there comes to be a point where you you look at what you pay for a property, you look at the market, and you say, like I said, I think this is probably the highest this one will go. Um, it's a hundred years old. So there was there were some maintenance issues that I knew would just continue to get worse. Um, but that property is actually not a property that I would buy today, right? We talked about that before. So some some of the things that I'm selling now are things that are no longer in my buy box. Like now I like concrete structures, or I'm sorry, I like brick structures on concrete slabs. I like properties that are older than the 60s, you know. Um, on concrete slabs. So looking at getting rid of some of the things that I feel like are at the top of the market and what would be offered for them, but also are no longer in my buy box. And yeah, it, it helps when you have a realtor praying <laughs> too. All right, other comments, questions on this one, or um, actually we'll open up the floor now to any general comments, feedback, things people are working on that they wanna share. Hey, Pops, I'm on my call right now. All right. Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. All right, bye. Any, uh, any other comments, questions folks have going on? Maybe you have something totally different that you wanted to talk about tonight. Um, Keith Hadley, I see your comment on Facebook. I'm going to uh, private message you. All right, any 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 other any other? Uh, come on, y'all. Y'all usually are wide open. So, what else we got going on? I don't want to be the only one talking. <laughs> I'm uh, heading out to um, South Carolina this week. Um, Johnson, gonna go. Uh, Go we'll meet up with the um, multifamily group out there. I know that you've got a mastermind you're going out for. When when is that one going to be? That one's November 18th. So, oh, okay. yeah, that's that's awesome. Carolina is like the hotbed of multifamily investing. Right Isn't it? <laughs> it's really nice out there too. I'm like, I need to I need to have a second home there or something. So, yeah. um, it's just beautiful. So, what are, what's the topic for discussion? Is it just like a meet and greet or? Um, there's going to be a meet and greet. Uh, so I, I've set up, I set up a lunch with um, people I've, I've invited over. Um, there's a, a guy that's got a, 
a coffee thing that's going on. And then uh, in the afternoon, they're gonna be meeting at a brewery. Uh, the next day, um, uh, Yaden and Jennings is having um, uh, kind of their mini mastermind on, on their boat. So I paid to go on that thing. So that, that should be interesting. He's, uh, he's invited some high, high, uh, high uh, players, big players. And in, in, so they get to rub some elbows here. Man, you know what happens when you when your friends change? Your thinking changes. Yeah, I hear you. Serious, man. Your wallet changes too. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah, your wallet changes when your friends change. So I'm excited about that. Um, you know, actually, before this call today, I was on the uh, I was on the phone with uh, I'll use Sam Barr because that's who I was on the phone with. But okay. Uh, Sam Barr is a, a kind of a mobile home investor, mobile home park investor, but he's also a cash flow investor. And he actually called me today to ask me a question, but the goals that I got from him, um, the goal that I got from him was just like, whoa, <laughs> like just in a problem that I'm dealing with. And hearing how he was thinking about it actually made me feel like I wasn't crazy for how I was thinking about it. And that's a lot of times how these, these masterminds go, right? You get yeah. around people who are trying to grow, they're trying to perform better and they end up like, it's just better. You're not alone. Um, I don't know if anybody has felt that, but if you, if you're really trying to push, if you're really trying to get to another level, a lot of times you start to feel, <clears throat> out, feel like you're alone in that progress because a lot of people are comfortable and and they don't want to make that progress so surrounding yourself in a mastermind with people that are pushing as well can be very motivating yeah i'm reading um who not how right now I'm, i actually finished it um i'm rereading it so it's, yeah. a, it's a, a good book about um reaching out and, and collaborating with people can't can't do stuff in a silo right um, there's a lot of people that can do things better than you can do and, um, and you can reach out and either get help or, or partner with people to, to, you know, grow your business and grow your, uh, influence. So, yeah. um, yeah, that's pretty, pretty cool. Who, not how that's a good book too. Anybody else have anything on their mind tonight? We've got about 10 more minutes. Uh, we just talked real estate. For those of you on Facebook Live, um, just check our events page on Monday nights. We do a group. This is a live Zoom call that we're going to start posting to Facebook every now and then um, for a special group of people. So um, look out for more info on that later in the week. But um, we're going live tonight just because we want to invite you in here. It's a totally free group. We mastermind. We've got folks in here that are doing all kinds of stuff. So Anybody else have anything tonight that y'all want to bring up? Questions, things you're working on, celebrate successes. Anybody got anything? I think uh, I probably would be ready to refinance one of my duplexes um, to get the cash out and then uh, probably reinvest it in, into another deal. So I, I would probably be looking for people to partner up um, and uh, uh, buy some multifamily apartments or um, self-storage facilities. So if anyone has uh, any deals that they're working on, you know, please reach out. I, I, would, I would love to connect. All right, so Eugene just said, I've got some money. If you need some money, reach out to me. Right. So for those folks that are saying um, I can't find any money, like the action here would be to be chatting with him to get his information or linking up with him on Facebook. Right. Yeah. Am, am I am, am I getting that right, Eugene? That's correct. Uh, <laughs> I'm also going to be I'm also going to be, uh, you know, trying to see if, we, you know, we can raise more money uh, from our. Uh, one of my some of my friends and uh, other people that i met uh during this uh short multi-family journey uh so 
you know, if you need to raise a capital, uh, we're going to try that as well. So just looking uh, to get into the multifamily or self storage deals um, as fast as I can. And uh, hopefully uh, partner up with the uh, folks that uh, are knowledgeable and uh, trustworthy. Awesome. Awesome, Eugene. Glad to have you in here, man. Been glad to have you the last the last month, man. Um, your perspective, your questions, very thoughtful, very thorough. Um, Thank you. Appreciate anybody, it. Anybody else have anything going on? Um, comments like the one Eugene just made. I want to make a point because um, we've got a little extra time tonight. Like, like it's okay to message him and just say, "What were you talking about?" Right? If you don't know what he's talking about, like just message him and say, "What did you have in mind?" right? Or find him on private message and schedule a time with him to talk about what he's got going on. How did you get your first duplex? Um, what are you talking about with a refinance of the duplex, right? Like, how long have you owned it? How much are you going to be able to refi it out of it? Those are okay questions to ask. And um, I'm sure he'd be more than willing to, to help as well. All right, other comments, questions, things that would benefit everybody. Anybody running into a problem, maybe you're running into a problem that you want to bounce off of realtors, other investors, wholesalers, landlords, anybody running into anything that you want to bounce off of anybody else in the room? Everybody's quiet. Yeah, I say I'm having some... Uh, some challenges right now <laughs> with a uh, fourplex that I bought uh, probably like a year ago um, in uh, one of the like smaller cities in Pennsylvania, about like 15,000 people or so. Uh, that was my second uh, home. And I was uh, still kind of, uh, I'm still, I'm still not, I'm, I'm still kind of new to this, but uh, at that time it was uh, even uh, probably newer. Um, and, uh, I didn't realize, I didn't realize that that town doesn't really have like really good property managers. So yeah. what I'm trying, <laughs> what I'm, what I'm doing, my, what I'm doing right now is, uh, me managing those, uh, units instead of the property management company. And it's like becoming sometimes very challenging. So probably, um, one probably lesson is uh, if you do want to invest into the smaller cities, you know, try to see if there are good property management companies. Yeah, so that definitely happens. Um, I've had that have that happen. Um, a suggestion, Eugene, like one of the things that I've kind of learned about that is once you know what good property management looks like, anybody can help you, right, manage your property. So you may want to think about like looking for realtors in that area that are go-getters. Like some of them will help you manage your property if it's not a lot of property. Um, but also like just posting an ad on Facebook and saying, hey, I need somebody to help me collect rent to find contractors when there's a repair issue. And a lot of times those people like retired people or people um, that just need something to do <laughs> uh, or want to make a little extra money every month will help you uh, manage your property in small markets. So that's a, that's a good advice. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, hey Eugene, I got, I got a quick question. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like for, for someone I'm looking to uh, maybe go into a property manager. Can you tell me some things that you like, maybe don't like about them? some of the things they were doing just where I can look out. Sound like you got a property manager, but you still having to manage some. Um, in, in, in that, in that small market. Yes. Yeah, so with the one you was, you were saying, so, so do you have them as a property manager right now? Or are you uh, just looking for one? I'm uh, like, so I have, I have a realtor who is uh, doing like a who can do like a small work for me. Like if I need to pass a message to all the tenants, uh, I can just, you know, message him and he'll go there and just, you know, pass it, pass the message that, uh, pass, pass the message. 
Uh, but uh, if I need to find someone to fix things, I have a contractor, uh, basically on call, but it's like uh, sometimes like he's super busy and if things break, I need to find another person. So you know, like small things like that, that uh, take, you know, could take time out of my uh, uh, schedule that, uh, that are unplanned, you know, could uh, influence some other things that I may be doing that, uh, you know, need my attention as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I'm saying, so do you have a property manager now or, or no? Um, not. It's like a hundred percent. Okay. Okay. Which... So what, what are you, what are you looking for? You just want to know what you're looking for in a, in a property manager, what to look for? Uh, well, basically handle all no, the... I, Eugene, I, I know what, where you're at. I was, uh, I was trying to um, answer Ramon, you know, what. Yes. For. Oh, okay. So that's a, that's a question for Ramon. Yeah. Okay. So. Yes, that's what I was. So there's there's a number of things that um, I've you know, and I haven't had too bad of an experience with um, with property managers. The, the one thing that I have had an issue with is that uh, they're not they're not as motivated to get your property up and running um, in a turn as as you are. And so you know if they're if they're managing a number of of units, you know they might not show you the attention that that you might might want. So I found that the problem manager that, that I don't have a problem with him in that he's, when I interviewed him, he had really good processes. He, he, um, he could answer all my questions about how he handles, um, you know, tenants and, and, and problems with tenants. Uh, how does he uh, evict people? And a lot of times, um, you know, what you're looking for is a property manager that makes sure that they vet, they vet the the, the folks before they even get in your property, right? So make sure that they have a good process for for uh, finding good tenants, right? Um, and then mm -hmm. if they do find a bad one, then you know how do they how do they go about getting rid of them? And if they know, you know, how long have they been in business? Um, you know, how long? You know, so the guy that I'm I'm with, he his family's been in this business for, you know, almost forty years. Um, uh, um, you know, he's got a number of contractors that are on 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 staff and stuff that uh, that can help out um but but the turns have been just very slow um so that's that's been my my big complaint but i i mean i can share with you i think i have a, a list of questions that i ask i haven't had to interview a uh, property manager in a while but i could uh, i could throw that out at you yeah that'd be that'd be great i'll um i'll shoot you a text or email yeah, think, sure. Let me check. I think I still got your information. I'll check. Yeah, yeah. And Ramon, I would tell you to find somebody that um that that you can hold accountable. Um, I mean, when you give them a task, that they're going to complete the task. And I know that those are things that you're going to be looking for, but not someone you don't want to, like he said, to give you excuses. You want somebody who's going to get in there and get the job done. But I can mm -hmm. also tell you that um. A lot of the times you pay for what you get. So if you're trying to lowball somebody just to get somebody to do the work, then they're going to be here. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. pay makes a big difference because, right. you know, you don't, you're paying somebody $10 an hour, they're going to give you $10 an hour work. And I don't know what your budget <laughs> or what your goal is, but I can tell you, you know, when you start setting expectations, well, I want you to do this and do this. And then they go back and say, well, you only paid me $10. So I'm going to give you your $10 worth. So you just also got to be mindful in, in, in what your expectations are and make sure that pay kind of reaches or, or, or meet the expectations or the needs that you want. Right. Okay. I think another, another thought on that is like, you really, the problems of property management, like they, they will always be the problem, even for a property manager, right? Um, the problems that property managers have is tenants not paying on time, right? Or finding tenants when they when units go vacant, turning over units that are empty, right? These are problems of of uh, property managers everywhere. Uh, fixing things that break, right? That's the responsibility of property management. 
the difference between really good property managers and property managers that are not really good is if they have the systems and the resources to address those things without making it a headache, right? So <clears throat> one of the things in Tupelo that I found is, you know, you got to find a property management company that has the systems or the resources. If you go to a property management company and they, the person that answers the phone is exhausted and, and they're tired because the phone rings all day and they don't have any help, they're not going to be good at managing your stuff, right? Because you're just going to be an additional problem to them. Um, if you ask them, how long does it take you to get to a maintenance item? Or you're sitting in the office and you hear a tenant come in that's complaining because they've had a maintenance issue for two months, right? They're not going to be good at managing your stuff either. So them having the resources and the, the people to manage your property effectively is very important. Um, and that's, that's been hard to find, uh, like Eugene was saying, in smaller markets, it can be hard to find. Hey, it's 702. We're going to jump off of here. I'm going to turn the Facebook Live off. Um, but we do this every Monday night at uh, 6 p.m. So I'm turning off the Facebook Live. Some of us may hang in here for a few more moments. But uh, glad you all were able to join us today. Um, if you got to go, it's 7 o'clock. So totally understand.